this episode of Skeptico. Getting real about the big picture questions. We have covered science, medicine, technology, and the physical world. We search for something greater beyond our understanding. We search for the origin of the universe, the greatest conceivable existence. And how the data from a variety of spiritually transformative experiences is staring us right in the face. People who undergo these things are transformed in in so dramatic ways. How do you explain the fact that atheists now believe in supreme beings after having these spiritual transformative experiences or dramatically change their opinions on, on major aspects of philosophical and personal life? That first clip is kind of interesting. It's from the movie Proximity when E.T. comes down looking for Jesus or just somebody who can tell him what the real story is. And the second clip was from returning guest, the very excellent Dr. Robert Davis, who I believe is really tapping into the keys of the kingdom when it comes to understanding E.T., and that is understanding spiritually transformative experiences. This is kind of a wide-ranging discussion, but I think it lands on a couple of really important points. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome right, to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality. I'm joined today by Dr. Robert Davis. Bob has been on the show a couple of times. He's kind of a go-to guy for me because, uh, well, a couple of things. One, he has just this stellar academic background, all the credentials, NIH grants, published peer-reviewed journals, all that stuff. And then he goes off and he writes all these terrific books about all this off-the-wall stuff like spiritually transformative experiences, consciousness beyond the biological robot, meaningless universe nonsense, UFOs, just because it comes up, Kundalini stuff. So he just recently sent me this, which is a paper he just published in Edge magazine, which is from the Journal of Scientific Exploration, which if you know this show, you know, it's a terrific journal. It's peer-reviewed, top-notch people who are thinking out of the box but are really doing science. So Bob publishes this paper, Spiritually Transformative Experience Triggers. Great stuff. Piqued my interest, uh, particularly as it relates to tying just a a lot of stuff together that is, um, like for all of us, that is us listening to Skeptico, we get it. We get that you can't just talk about um, consciousness without talking about near-death experience, out-of-body experience, psychedelic experience, maybe ET experience. And so what Bob is doing is kind of putting that all on the table, again, in a scientific way and saying, hey, maybe we need to talk about all this stuff together in order to have a meaningful discussion. But then Bob made the mistake of sending me a video he has recently stumbled across, which many of us have seen by this time, with Dr. Gary Nolan at the Salt Connections, which if you're unfamiliar, is kind of like TED Talk kind of thing, like beefed up TED Talk kind of thing, where he says 100% aliens have already arrived. So. I am just laying the groundwork here and also for my friend, Bob, to let him know that, buddy, you've kind of uh, laid, laid the foundation for me pulling you in a million directions beyond spiritually transformed experiences. And uh, let's get to it, right? Oh, please. I look forward to it. And thank you. I can't. I can't follow up on that introduction. Uh, thank you for that. You, you know, this is a chess game, and and there are so many pieces out there that that one tries to make sense of. And I and I did that my whole life in a in a scientific uh, setting, in a laboratory setting, of course, in a public or parish environment. And and since retirement, I dedicate that same level of curiosity to what I deem to be the most important questions of of our time, of all times. You know, what is the nature of reality? What is consciousness? All of these things that we don't, that language can't ideally explain, express the subjective experience. 
the interactions with alternate realms, non-human intelligences, call them ETs, whomever, the deceptions and lies that are out there by so-called experts that we hear, brain hacking uh, galore, misinformation abounds. But wait a minute, How, why do you put those things together necessarily? Like because, that's the level, that's, hold on, that's the level three stuff that you and I will talk about. And then sometimes I think we breeze past things in a way that doesn't let other people into the conversation we're having. Because sure. for you to say spiritually transformative experiences are clearly, if you study them scientifically, as you have, they we start to see these patterns across these all sorts of these experiences. Patterns across near-death experience, out-of-body experience, psychedelic experience dare we say ET experiences. So you break that down in a scientific way and you write the papers and read it and we all go, wow, there's these cultural filters that we can apply on it. But when we strip past our individual personality, there seems to be what science would call an observable pattern. But Bob, you can't start laying on the deception and the misinformation because that ne doesn't necessarily have anything to do with that. Why is it so hard for other academics, intellectuals, people we rely on to kind of do the full stop with just where you're at with the spiritually transformed experiences, which seems obvious and say, okay, that's a reality that we have to deal with. Why do we have deception and misinformation on top of that? Well, it, it's unfortunate, and and it, that that some of that exists. It's, it certainly exists in all levels of society, and certainly in ufology, uh, because of the existing misinformation that we have all been exposed to, and we continually hear that, trying to seek the truth. Now, if you even today, as we speak, for instance, NASA is having a hearing on the on UAPs. Uh, the, the arrow just had it. You know, I would focus on the scientific evidence for uh, any definitive word. You know, when when people start going into this spiritual transfer of experiences, which I don't denounce, I, I fully uh, am a proponent of the evidence and, and continue to try to seek ways in which we can make sense of it in, in like a, a trying to separate the sense of the nonsense of uh, the misinformation from what truly is scientific, in other words. And, and not biased by even science itself. I see misinformation in science because the explanations for these near-death, out-of-body, kundalini, et cetera, uh, experience that transform people in remarkable, permanent ways, uh, and they try to seek expl explanations with fierce determination from that moment forward, their explanations are discipline-specific. They're biased. So we are being fed, not intentionally with misinformation, but with inaccurate, biased uh, perspectives that are based on one's previous educational uh, experience. If I'm a neuroscientist and I do an experiment with giving somebody DMT and they say they interacted with non-human entities, perceived an alternate reality, and now they believe in a deity where before they were atheists, and they're and life after death and the whole nine yards, and they're transformed. And this has happened. We see this in studies at John Hopkins and in other places. Well, that's meaningful. That means something. But but does that really mean the person interact with an alternate realm as they claim and believe during their nine to five job in an office setting at this time, even though it happened you know five years ago? It's real, like the back of their hand. Yet the neuroscientists will give an explanation that's brain-based, ego dissolution based on connectivity increases in this region versus it. You know, that point of view, when in fact that could be, I, misinformation may be the wrong term, but the reader, the reader is misinformed or a donut is interpreting it too literally. Hold on. Let me, let me pause yeah. you there because sure. we, we might start mixing things together again in a way that I want to really make a concerted effort to pull apart. So you ha I have this experience, right? I'm in the Rick Strassman studies in New Mexico. They're ordained by the government where you're going to give me DMT. I take the DMT. I go and I go into the shapeshifter world, the shamanic world, and I see these other things. And they look a lot like what ET contactees have described in this and that. I have that experience. And as you describe it, 
that experience is real to me. And then as you point out in your books, which are terrific because your books are not just science, they are scientific because you're a scientist, but they're also experiential. You have experience with the UFO phenomena. You have experience with the after death realm, whatever, even though we can't describe that completely. So you're kind of coming at this from a different perspective. And I think when you then talk about the neurologist who's trying to process that, I think we have to kind of make a, a, a cleaner break there in terms of that neurologist a lot of times is operating in this, as I call it, biological robot, meaningless universe, materialist perspective that is just a major misstep. I mean, we don't have to bring them into the club and say, oh, they have an opinion too. No, they're just kind of flat earthing it in a way for somebody like you who's, who's looked at all this evidence and all this science, you, you would just kind of be nice, but you'd pat them on the head and say, you know, go do about 10 years of research and then come back. So I think sometimes we confuse the issue when we talk about the neurologist who is just not clued into, has this dogmatic view of things that has clouded their vision. And we put that side by side with who we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, a Dr. Gary Nolan, who from every way we look at it is playing a game, man. He's peddling an agenda. He's CIA. He's and once you're partially CIA, you're CIA all the way. And there's all these other connections. So whether he is all that or not, I'm not against Gary Nolan. Seems like a great guy to me. But I'm just saying that potentially is a different character on this playing field than your normal, you know, run of the mill, Sam Harris, just kind of clueless neuroscientist who's caught up in their own, I'm an atheist, therefore I got to protect my turf kind of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I kind of belaboring a point there that 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 needs to be drawn out, or is it obvious to everybody? Yeah, th th there's there's a lot there, and that's that's why I approach it almost as as if it is a chess game. You know, you, you bring up my personal experiences. Yeah, I saw two iron jobs. I had a shared death experience, not near death, a shared death, a knowingness that my colleague died, which we discussed. Uh, something that's uh, indescribable, but intensely meaningful. Uh, and I had a Kundalini awakening, remarkable energetic uh, shift, uh, very positive, uh, very meaningful. I'm not alone. It flipped me like it does many, many people. And that has been well documented by, by Walla Cott. I think she was a, 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 you interviewed her, uh, a, a researcher, professor at the University of Oregon. What's going on? And then you have Straussman, you mentioned, with the DMC studies, and John Mack, a psychiatrist, they met, they, they compared their notes between the, the people who claim to be, have, have had interactions with non-human entities associated with the UAP and Straussman's evidence with DMT subjects, and, and they were blown away, literally, quote unquote, by the, the similarity of the ex experiences of these two distinctly dissimilar groups. And I take that and I embed that in the article. Then I'll, I'll take other pieces that I regard as quite interesting from so-called experts. I, I try to seek out that, that kind of objective information as best as possible. Not that they're correct, at no means, nor is my interpretation of the evidence correct, but I'm trying to make sense of nonsense or misinformation, not intentionally, not purposely, not always purposeful deception, not always, but we see evidence of that certainly, and we'll get there to make a coherent whole as best as possible. So the neurologist will flat earth it, you know, will put uh, his or her diatribe on it, discipline specific and bias, as I mentioned. But but then you have, uh, you mentioned Gary Nolan. I don't know if you want to go there now. Uh, well regarding his field, the geneticist, immunologist from Stanford University, Nolan Labs named after him. We go on and on with his Vita. And he comes out at the SALT conference just a few days ago, and he says 100%, he believes 100% ET is real, and they're here. Pause right there. Pause right there. We'll play it. It would be helpful to qualify yourself. Because you are going to make some very bold statements here today. And I would love for people to understand why they should believe you. And so perhaps, can you give a little bit of your background? Sure. Um, so I'm a professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford. Uh, the primary research work in my lab is cancer immunology, virology, 
We also do a lot of work in bio threat. So we've worked with Ebola, Zika, uh, COVID um, when it was a big problem. Primarily the work in my lab is the development of instrumentation and algorithms to understand the complexity of the immune system in cancer. And in the process of doing that, we've created a, any of a number of technologies, which we spun out into companies. It's now nine companies, two of them are on NASDAQ. Uh, and these immunology instruments are used pretty much around the world uh, in almost any advanced immunology uh, analysis and work. Understood. And I'm curious, do you believe that extraterrestrial intelligence has visited planet Earth? I think you can go a step further. It hasn't just visited, it's been here a long time and it's still here. We'll end it there and then we'll, we'll come back to it. But I wanna let you know where I'm going with Gary Nolan. Sure. And that's sure. that I think he's carrying water for somebody else. So what are you thinking when you see Gary Noland? Who is he to you? What is he doing? What is he talking about? Gary, I think, is the modern day version of John Mack. Similarities and obvious differences, of course. Uh, John Mack, again, your, your audience, I'm sure, is familiar with him. For those not, he was, again, a psychiatrist at Harvard who had a fight for tenure after advocating again that he you know, believed that people believed that they were interacting with non-human intelligence, et cetera. But Gary Nolan is saying that as it applies to, you would think, the nuts and bolts. We have some metamaterials uh, analyzing it. I'm consulting with the CIA and others who have access to it. And, and he's you know, likely not disclosing it. And that's why he maybe says, I'm 100% certain, without disclosing it, not a purposeful disinformation, but a maybe, maybe a little misdirection saying he ha he's convinced he has the evidence, but it's not the right time to share it. And in a sense, uh, you know, he's, he's letting the cat out of the bag before the evidence in, in detail is provided. That's the only thing I could think of why he says 100%. Uh, unless he's preparing us for some disclosure that's about to happen. Okay, but but he, here's the pause. I got to put in that. And that's that, you know, this is who else Gary Nolan is. And I have, I've pulled up on the screen right now. Yeah, I got it. I got it. That he makes to Fauci at the end, when Fauci retires, he says, thank you, Dr. Fauci, for your tremendously positive contributions to immunology and virology. And I just got to play a couple other little clips into this one to fully put that into context. Because the first place I'd go with the Gary Nolan thing, which some people might have forgotten, but Diana Walsh Posolka, who wrote the book American Cosmic, which was extremely influential book. The main characters in that book are two guys. And there are pseudonyms in the book. One is James and one is Tyler Durden. And James is the good guy. He's the guy who's doing the real science. And, and here's what she says about, about James. And James is outed later as none other than Dr. Gary Nolan. Okay, so the thing is, is and I thought, and I hoped that I conveyed that at first I was very suspicious and to the point of being frightened, really, of a lot of the people that I met, because they were not at a level that, you know, they were, these were not people that I'd ever met before. And there were some who were professors and who were studying this as well. And I, I kind of bonded more with them, like James in the book. I bonded with James a lot more, and he's a good friend of mine. And so the other people that are, you know, way out there and doing the that space. Can I just interject something? Because the weirdness never stops. Yeah, that's James, right? James is also an experiencer who's had multiple experiences with ET, if you want to call it that for simple terms. And his main driving ambition research project is to kind of counteract this ability that ET has to seem to just bump into us in the extended consciousness realm wherever he wants. And he wants to have greater control of that. So again, you know, maybe I'm making too big a deal out of this, but James in Diana Walsh Pasolka's book, which is this phenomenal book showing about the invisible college and how there's these good guys who you can really trust. 
And I'm not going to give you his name. His name is James, but his name is really Gary Nolan, as it's later revealed. And he's a good guy. He's a scientist like I am, you know, because she's a tenured professor in religious studies, right? But this is also Gary in August of 2022, when he's saying Fauci, tremendously positive contributions to immunology and virology. Now, I don't have to remind folks, but I think I will, who Dr. Anthony Fauci turns out to be now in 2023. So as I play these next couple of clips into this, I want you to keep in mind, what is Gary thinking? How is Gary, the Stanford scientist, the Stanford immunologist? Now all the data's in. You can analyze it. You can look across the board. How is he maintaining that position? Given what? Well, yeah. Hold on one sec. Let me play it. I know I'm jabbering it up here, but that's, uh, I'm not going to, That's right. I can apologize Take for that. Time. I'm just going to play it in and we'll Go have ahead. plenty of time to talk. Let me sure. get this. Sure. Hey, conspiracy theorists, as you know, questioning Albert Baller, CEO of Pfizer, or Anthony Fauci, former head of everything important, is basically an attack on science itself. So, if there were a test that could have revealed that many of the laws and measures that were undertaken during the pandemic were unnecessary, and the CDC ignored that test, then that would be what? Unscientific? It depends on what they say it is, stupid, you bloody conspiracy theorist. <laughs> You remember Albert Baller saying that RFK in questioning certain medications is questioning science itself. Anthony Fauci essentially said in a weird Judge Dread way, I am science. Let's remind ourselves what these smug dictators were telling us just a matter of months ago and try to remember this is the world you're still living in. This is the price you're still paying. What is your level of concern that we're going to discredit public health officials to the point of uh, you know, look at Russia. I see you're looking at them and I raise you. Proxy war with them. And also, we can say that they even caused Donald Trump. Mm, that's not going to work for long. They actually have a good vaccine and none of their citizens will take it because they don't trust their own government. It's very dangerous, Chuck, because a lot of what you're seeing as attacks on me, quite frankly, are attacks on science. Oh! Oh, you are the embodiment of science, are you? What a scientific thing to say. That an entire dogma could be embodied in an individual. Okay, that was a very excellent Russell Brand. We could also go to mainstream media at this point, which has the, the science is so overwhelmingly turned against what they perpetrated with the jab thing and how the science was completely the other way and they turned their back on it. So I'm going to return to Gary Nolan. <laughs> I can't let him off the hook for, for what he says about Fauci. I think that reveals more than just about anything else we can hear him say about his background, about Stanford, about his grants, about his CIA work. He's carrying the water for somebody else because no one in their right mind would, would say that at this point about Fauci. To me, it kind of reveals it all. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know if there's a cause effect there. I, that may be one way to interpret what he said, but another way, the way I would interpret it would be that he's he's looking at Fauci's past achievements. I do know a well-respected virologist who uh, actually patented the rotavirus, and and I asked him during COVID what, what he thought about Fauci, and all he said was the man is absolutely brilliant. His contributions to the field of virology are are unquestioned. That's why he holds the position. So I think Did the point is RFK? Nolan's statement, I think, was related to that. And I want to be on your good side, more political and, and in recognition of his great past and ignoring his COVID contribution, which in retrospect could have, could be, and I'm not one to interpret it, could be a disaster. You know, it could be, uh, you know, but so, yeah. it's more of an emotional disaster. The scars that is left on society are, are unimaginable. That's, you know, that's where I focus. And we have yet to even realize that, I think, what it's done to, to people all over the world. Did you read RFK Jr.'s book on Fauci? Are you aware no. of it? No. Okay. So it's kind of the definitive work on his history. And his, his history is the opposite of what you just said, if you carefully go through it. He's mixed in with the whole AIDS, HIV thing in a very unscrupulous mm. way, very, mm. very despicable Mm. career in medicine, in my yeah. opinion, and in the, in the opinion of many people who've read that book, which, by the way, was the number one book on Amazon for the longest time and got zero I'll look at, reviews. I'll look at it. 
got zero reviews in any mainstream publication. So there's no New York Times, Wall Street. They completely ignored it, just like they're trying to ignore him now as he's running for president. Point being, there's 150 pages of notes, you know, footnotes in that book to the research that Fauci did, which contradicts what your friend who's just probably going with the mainstream narrative. Unforgivable, I think, for a serious academic in virology to be tremendously grateful for his contributions without looking at him as potentially someone who's just run the largest scientific scam in history, which at this point, there's no other way. The burden of proof would be on someone to say that the pandemic was something other than the largest medical scam in history. The burden of proof it suggests that it is. So I'm open to the possibility that it isn't, but man, you're going to have to convince me. And if you can't, then what does that say about Gary Nolan? That's why I keep coming back to this, because what does this say about how we're supposed to understand one aspect of the spiritually transformative experiences? And that is the ET. If Gary Nolan is the guy who's partially responsible for controlling the narrative, then he's controlling your narrative as well in a way that maybe you haven't fully considered. Well, you're, you're, you're exactly right. He, he's a focal point of public attention as well as attention by many in academia. So, of course, he, he can persuade. He consults with the CIA. He consults, supposedly, according to what he says, with all peoples in the know, as far as UAPs are concerned. He does meta-material analysis. He is an admitted experiencer. People identify, certainly, with that. Who else within the community, other than those who just don't focus on him, and there are probably most people in society, and, and just go, if they're interested in ufology, on, on what uh, the DOD now NASA, et cetera, are, are all doing about it, as well as the Galileo Project, which Nolan is also involved in. And I credit Abby Loeb, you know, in the same breath as, as to commend them in, in one sense. I don't know if they have anything else up their sleeve, but they're like a John Mack in a sense that they're, they're risking their reputation, their status in some ways, and they're pushing the envelope. And you need one white crow in a sense, or, or a scientist who does make that incredible discovery, maybe, or or it comes out of citizen science, uh, you know, in terms of the public generating research on their own with limited funds to try to unravel this chess game that we all seem to be playing. I think you're a hell of a lot closer to unraveling it than these guys are. That's my point. I think these guys, Avi Loeb, if you listen carefully to what he's saying, he doesn't believe in ET. I mean, he not only does he not believe in ET, he doesn't believe in UFO. Right. So w- when you fully process that, it's back to what I was saying, like with your stuff, with the spiritually transforming experiences. And then you talk to Sam Harris and he's like, well, hey, I think consciousness is still an illusion. You know, I'm going to spin this stuff about meditation, but it's still all brain based. Consciousness is an illusion. It's like you really don't have a seat at this table. Like, I don't know if you're just making that stuff up or not but you really don't have a seat at that table. Avi Loeb, when he says UFOs, hey, if we ever run across them, they might be real. It's like, bro, if we ever run across them, you are somehow, you you don't really have a seat at the table. You, on the other hand, my friend, is who I'm turning to in this discussion because you definitely got a seat on the table. You are way, way ahead of the curve by virtue of this spiritually transformative experiences across the board where you include this UAP UFO experience and quotes like this from that article, as with any experience that's filtered through our layers of culture, language, and individuality, STEs, that is spiritually transformative experiences, also share several similarities, themes, and features. Man, we could do a whole hour just on that because it's so deep. That is not where Gary Nolan is coming from. Gary Nolan is trying to misdirect us away from that. Avi Loeb, he's trying to misdirect us by saying, well, none of that stuff could possibly even be on the table because there's no such thing as consciousness. Consciousness is an illusion. So here's where I'm going to take you to. This guy, Ray Hernandez, Beyond UFOs, 
a project to try and wrap our arms around those experiences and a project that you were directly involved in. You were called to be a part of because you do have not only the academic credentials, but you have the academic muscle to know how to collect data. Tell us about that project, because I think it relates more to the real story of what's going on behind Gary Nolan and the rest of these guys than the fake story. So tell me, what was this project? The Dr. Edgar Mitchell Research Foundation for Extraordinary Experiences. I, uh, it was developed by, uh, and certainly the sixth person who walked on the moon, founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, great Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Over time, Ray Hernandez and a few others developed the the study, and I came on board about a year or two in progress after I wrote my UFO book. They heard me on some podcasts and, and invited me to, to join, and I was thrilled. I was a, a kid in a candy store. I was interested, always interested in UFOs, and I was always interested in research. And I, this is a tremendous opportunity for me to interact with many scientists. And, and eventually, I, I told them, I'm going to get this published. And I did in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. I wrote it up with Russ Calpone primarily. Ray Hernandez was also a co-author. And without Russ Galpone's help, I, I, his statistical analysis it wouldn't have been been accepted. But so a referee journal, and I'm proud about it because it does say something quite significant. Uh, again, it's not it, it's <laughs> not accepted by NASA, the DoD, Arrow, etc. Because it, it's not nuts and bolts. We're talking about spiritual transformative experiences, qualitative subjective experiences. And we did a survey of over 3,200 individuals. Many people are very familiar with that, and there is. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into great details about it, but we there are many limitations, obviously. But the fact that some 3,200 people are in it, you know, it kind of weeds out the the people who you can't. Uh, trust or mis misinforming us purposely or, or schizophrenic, for instance, and are making it up for whatever reason, there's a secondary gain. Nevertheless, a large sample size that was controlled as best as possible statistically in terms of validity and right, reliability. And again, I thank Russ Scalpone for that. We came up with some interesting data, which has been supported by subsequent studies by Kathleen Martin at the, at the Experience and Research Team at MUFON and a few others. But what we found was that the, the majority, again, approximately 80, 85%, regarded as a positive interaction. The more times I interacted with the UAP, either physical or non-physical, either as an abductee or a contactee, they regarded it as a positive experience, especially if those interactions were more frequent in nature. And we saw an increase in positivity, which again was statistically derived in terms of four specific criteria that were weighted most heavily in terms of positivity criteria. So again, it was, was finely tuned analytically. And using that criteria, we, we saw an increase in positivity with increases in interactions, whatever that meant to them, entering another matrix, an alternate realm, a non-earthly environment, or a, a spacecraft lying on a table being subjected to experimental paradigms, be given a hybrid. We know the whole story. The point is, initially, of course, it's horrific. Let's not let's not discount that. Well, hold on before you go to horrific, because <laughs> I want to go horrific too. But I, I want to pause and and sure. let people know why I was kind of trying to rally you up a little bit is because of this. Like you got the goods here, Bob. You've gone and done the freaking work. And like the last time you were on, and I tried to push you on some of the data, and you push right back and say, no, I know how to do this kind of research. I know how to scientifically collect data in a scientific survey and analyze it statistically and get it published in a peer-reviewed journal. And that still means something, man. It does if it's done correctly and their peers are really looking at it. And that lends tremendous credibility to what you're saying when I pull up that edge article and spiritually transformative experiences. Now people know what I mean. Bob knows what he's talking about with this particular spiritually transformative experience, which was the ET encounter. And how do we know that's a spiritually transformative experience? Because we ask people, they say, I had this experience that knows spiritually transformative. That makes you more of an authority on 
how these spiritually transformative experiences work across the board, across the board being NDEs, OBEs, like we're saying, Strassman, and you just take DMT kind of thing. That conversation, they are trying to pull us miles away from that conversation. Gary Nolan, I would suggest, just like Lou Elizondo before him, who was carrying the, you know, go watch the videos on Lou Elizondo from a year ago. He's off the stage right now because he somehow discredited himself. But his thing was like, man, it's about protecting our airspace. And, you know, hey, if it's up there and it's a threat and this and that. So he had a message. He delivered that. Before that, it was Tom DeLong. You know, hey, man, you know, I'm I'm the, the cool generation. Blink 182. Here's my message. Carry in the water. I would suggest that that's the only way to view uh, Gary Nolan and Avi Loeb is they're just carrying the water with another message. You, my friend, are not. You're at the next level of trying to put this together. And the first step is to say there is an experience associated with this. And as you have written about and researched about so fantastically, it is the most profound experience we can imagine. It is a spiritually transformative experience. If we look at cultures, if we look at time, these are the things we value most are these experiences that scientists would say are spiritually transformative. Now you're saying that is at the core of all this stuff that these guys are talking about. Do you, do you get where I'm going? Do you get why I'm kind of poking you a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, there's no question. And th thank you for your kind words. As an authority, you know, I may be familiar a little bit with the, with the literature, trying to put the pieces together. You don't know whether or not you should include as, as objective evidence. Is, that's not biased, of course. What's the value, validity of the information that you hear in ufology and beyond? And that's why, and you allude to it beautifully, the, the data that's qualitative in nature that we generated in survey designs, it lacks in terms of what hardcore materialists regard as as reflections of the ultimate truth despite the fact that that people who who undergo these things are transformed in in so dramatic ways how do you explain the fact that atheists now believe in supreme beings after having these spiritual transformative experiences or dramatically change their opinions on on major aspects of philosophical and personal life to me, you know, at least it can be argued metaphysically, philosophically, which I'm not, but you can regard that as being the ultimate reality, truth, if it if it makes one more ecologically sensitive. And that's maybe a big issue. Uh, one of the pieces that I think you are aware of, and, and, and certainly many others are, when people have these kind of experiences, it seems like, of course, they're not the center of the universe anymore. They become like a particle of the wave. If you want to go into that wave particle duality thing, I mean, you really go in that direction and, and also make the analogy between the subjective experience and, and true reality, because the unitive experience that underlies the, the spiritual transformative experience, that unity where I feel interrelated with, with the world, reality, the environment, like they never have before. And it feels beautiful, normal, natural, peaceful, loving, all that glittering gold, new age stuff, but it's, but it's there. Let me interject something here, sure. Bob, because I think you're doing it in more of a way than you might even realize. The thing I always point out is... So the survey you guys do at Free and you publish is about experience in a way that we generally accept in science, right? So if someone is experienced depression, we accept that they are experiencing depression. If someone is experiencing grief, we accept that they are experiencing grief. We don't double clutch on that. We don't say, what is the physics? You know, How does it relate down to quantum physics kind of thing. And we don't just stop there. We say, we can measure that. That's what you're bringing to it. It's not like you're off in your own kind of thing. Oh, it's all anecdotal. You are applying rather well understood scientific principles to experience. And you're just applying them in an area that no one ever wanted to apply it to because it was the third rail and you're going to get electrocuted on your career. You're exactly right with respect to how we rely on surveys 
in order to inform our medical community how severe the pain is, how severe the depression is, you're exactly right. And often, often tailored appropriate doses of a specific drug to, to uh, minimize the severity of that particular symptom. Largely survey-based, largely anecdotal. How, how else can a psychologist, psychiatrist, medical physician get an understanding of your physical condition to understand <laughs> how you express it? Yet, Yet, you're exactly right. Yet, when, when you see survey results as it relates to the free survey or other surveys, and that's all they are in spiritual transformative experience related uh, research, all, all surveys except for the DMT, which is survey in terms of understanding the semantic, thematic content of the individual's experience under the DMT or, or psilocybin, but also correlating that with some underlying EEG neurophysiological patterns, whatever that may mean. Not, and that's not an answer other than there's major changes going on. There's no question about it. You know, is, is it DMT in the penis? We can only, we can only throw these things out and, and suspect. Well, let me just recap what you're saying, because yeah. it's important, is... So we go look at Strassman, spirit molecule, and we repeat it, and we mix in the DMT component, I would say, almost as a way of apologizing for the fact that what all that research is really about is the qualitative, the anecdotal. That's what it's all about. Because if you go look at the ayahuasca experience, right, and you go down to, hey, I was down in Peru, and the same thing, I'm taking Strassman's work, and they had the DMT, and down there they gave the DMT, and then one person goes... Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I didn't drink. They just came along and they just moved the feather. And I had the same experience. And now you go, whoa, Strassman has to push the materialistic. And I'm not saying he's pushing it, but the way that gets interpreted is it's about the DMT versus if we look more broadly at your work, I think your work points us to what's really going on. Is there something called a spiritually transformative experience? And we're not exactly sure what the correlation is between that and this biological robot part of us. And that's the heart of the current debate. There's no way to get an objective measure of one having an NDE. It's impossible because it's spontaneous in nature, except the one in which you can control. Here, here's some psilocybin DMT at an appropriate dose, and you get some incredible things happening. The value of psychedelics is, is significant in terms of those who can play around with it and try to make sense of something that changes their personality. And at the same time, you can get some hard data. So it pleases the materialists, and, and they go in that direction in terms of an explanation. And the qu question is, do you interpret hallucinations as real events? You know, they don't. They, they regard these reports as hallucinatory in nature and not evidence of an alternate reality, whereas another person would, would look at it in the reverse. So how do you relate to the subjective experience of these transpersonal events? And we know the statistics. Just to remind some people, 70%, for instance, of people who have a near-death experience, you know, Alex, have a divorce within seven years. It's remarkable, much higher than expected. But we see this with STEs. We need more data. We're scratching the surface, not only how it affects the person involved, the experiencer, but the family members, first, second, third person. And that's where we need to go. The some, uh, thematic, the semantic content of what the meaning meaning was of that event. Look for these com comparisons. And, and it's going to take a long time before science uh, adopts this as a true, valid reflection of reality. You are in the middle of creating this documentary, which you think is going to move the ball forward a little bit in terms of the issues that you were just talking about in terms of consciousness. It's called the consciousness connection. Let me play a little bit of just the end of the trailer and then we'll talk about it. Will we break through the stigma of this science of the extraordinary and challenge the true nature of reality in the consciousness connection? This is where we're putting your energy and it's where we should be putting our passion and our energy. And the metamaterials and the anti-gravitational stuff, I'm not saying that's not a path. But in terms of a more direct path, we have to go with the experience. It is the closest thing we have to 
potentially finding out the meaning of this. It's the experience. And that's where you are. It is a passion. It's an energy. My experiences, I mentioned earlier, certainly fueled that, uh, gave me the determination, that little hint that there likely is something more. My experiences told me something that beyond belief, never thought I could experience what I did. So I'm trying to make sense of it. But I'm making the documentary because I'm trying to find the pieces and keep researchers who look at human-to-human interaction on an invisible pathway or extrasensory perception, human-to-physical system interaction, psychokinesis, a near-death experience is certainly. We're going to be filming at the International Association for Near-Death Studies. We went to Monroe Institute, on and on. Ions. And yes, Gary Nolan, let's, you know, let's bring that into UFO. Not, not, it's everything. You're very selective. What he's doing, you have a top-notch academic edition, like many others. Dean Radin, Eben Alexander. And unfortunately, as a producer, you know, I'm out there saying we need funding for travel primarily to, to get from here to there, to, to make these kinds of interviews. But more than that, Alex, and you mentioned it, the experiencer. We do have experiences. Near the, people have had many of these. And that's the value of the film. Okay, Bob. So last question then. What concerns do you have about the signal to noise ratio if one does take, as you're talking about, the big tent approach, which I think is awesome. Talk to a lot of different people, but tying it back to the misinformation, disinformation, how do you balance that? Oh, very, very careful. I will do my very best to make sure that that's not the case because the the intent, and I can't be perfect, certainly, we're all moral human and make those errors of inductive reasoning. Deception abounds, and it certainly exists in all media forms, and I can be held hostage to that. So I I and Dave and Beatty and Wilson Hawthorne, my co-producers, we talked about that, and that's why we don't want to include UFOs. And we debated that, and, you know, getting Gary Nolan on on board is, is wonderful, but let's focus on other stuff. I don't want to really go there. I don't want to go there. We talked about Chris Bledsoe. Let's get some orbs, you know, and all that jazz. He's doing another documentary, and you can't, and he doesn't even address that. He, you can't get, you can't do it. Before he got the documentary, come on, come on up, spend the night, you know, take all the videos you want. I want he's wonderful. I have great, great respect for him. Uh, CIA is involved. Um, uh, John Alexander, I know, I spoke with him, and he's been up there, and, and he believes, and I may, may have mentioned this before, that, that Chris Bledsoe is the one responsible. He's the one that calls down these orbs. Well, that's his interpretation. But the CIA is always the CIA, retired or not, and they uh, will gather information among the citizenry and uh, see what they're up to. And that's probably the best source of information they can get. Uh, that's what that's their discipline when they do it very well. Even um, even getting up front and close and establishing personal relationships with people who are experiencers to try to extract information and deceiving them deceiving them um, to do so, g- gaining their trust, but also taking their brain. You know, call it brain hacking, whatever you want, but there's an ulterior motive. They're not mean and vicious, but they're deceptive. You know, they're deceptive people. They so, could be mean so, and vicious too, but... You know, I was just going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say. But that's so, unethical. It's unethical, you know, to be that way with another human being, as far as I'm concerned. You know, mission aside, they're, they're, and they admittedly tell people they're in counterintelligence. They admit that. So I, I said last question, but actually I'm going to stretch it out with one more question. Because, like, look, at, at a deep level, if one reads your books, one understands that you have this deeper spiritual connection yourself. The signal to noise ratio isn't lost on Dr. Robert Davis. I'm not sure that we can extend that courtesy to some of these other folks. And in particular, you know, the little thing you just did on the CIA, it's like, I guess I'd wrap this into the question of, you know, what do you think about my lab? Because one of the holes in the free survey that you did with Ray Hernandez is, hey, man, these things are 80% positive. Well, number one, I can't be absolutely sure that deception on that other side in terms of screen memory and all this other stuff, which we acknowledge, isn't somehow contaminating that in a way that we just effectively cannot measure because the technology on the other side 
on the non-human intelligence is sufficient to disguise it from us. So I just throw that out there. And if you want to respond to that, that's kind of one thing. But the other thing is then we go to the other 20%, which are negative. And it is clear to me at this point that the military abduction thing is 1000% in play. And the reason I'd say 1000% is because Gary Nolan said 100%. We got to beat him. But the other thing is, if you just look at the data, like look at Rendlesham Forest. I was just looking at that again because there's a new book out that's more research, more interviews with the participants, with the observers, the military guys who were there. That's 1980. And you know what they do to those guys who observe it, who see the trees being knocked down, see the trace elements on the of the craft, see the, the craft fly over the nuclear missiles and target. What do they do with those guys? They round their ass up. They bring them back to the base. They lock them down. They bring in the men in black, kind of not literally, but they bring in the heavy hitters. They illegally induce them with sh- sodium pentothal. They subject them to just the worst kind of tortured interrogation. They threaten them that you will be killed. Your family will be killed. If you ever tell anyone about this, and this is not just unique to the Rendlesham forest case. This is, we hear this all the time. The connection that I haven't heard a lot of people make is that's my lab. That's at least the beginnings of my lab because it's saying the military understands the abduction process enough to say, we got to figure it out. We got to know what those guys know. And if that is your 20%, what you guys found on free, I'm not sure that's not the big story rather than the 80% think it's positive. It's a, that's an interesting take. Uh, you can't discount that as a possibility. And I thought, I thought of that. How do you exclude um, uh, my lab? So, and, and I, and my labs has happened. Yes. It, question is, does it still happen? I don't know if abductions happens like sauces aren't seen and we don't have trace elements anymore. You know, you know, things change over time. Why does that mean motivations have changed? Objectives have changed? Decisions in some unacknowledged access program has changed or modified to conform for whatever reason to comply with changing events? I don't know. Could the 20% be the my lab be, be whisked away and sub- subjected to sodium pentothal and screen memory? Yeah, it happens. I know somebody who it happened to. And that's the basis of my books. Here's the facts. Go figure it out. I'll throw in a little two cents of my bias, yes, but I'm trying to orchestrate it. And and here's that section of of instruments, that section, that section. But let's bring it together and make music as best as possible. And that's the basis of what I'm trying to do. And whatever that means to people, if they can support it in whatever way, and I hate to keep bringing it up, visit our website at, at consciousnessfilm.info. We have a GoFundMe page. And thank you for the opportunity for for mentioning this and for the time in which to do so. So to help with travel, we're not expecting to make money on this. This is a, uh, what Dave and Wilson tell me is a passion project. They're they're artists as as producers, cinematographers. They make money, great. You know, I'm retired and, and, you know, 10, 20 years at best. And and I'm okay. Point is, it's a message. It's not ego, maybe a little bit that I still the human. And yes, so there's a little bit of ego, admittedly, but more importantly, what can I, what can I bring to the table, leave a legacy of, and maybe resonate with some people that that benefit in some way? Well, it's excellent, Bob. I always really, really enjoy the perspective you bring to this and the work you know you put in the work. So, thanks again. I'm sure we'll do it again when that when that movie gets out. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, Alex. Thanks again to Dr. Robert Davis for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I tee up from this interview is, what are spiritual, what are spiritually transformative experiences telling us about encounters with ET? Or you could ask that in reverse and kind of get an interesting question as well. Either way, take a stab at it and let me know what you think. Love to hear from you. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.